Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Garden Party. As you know, we're your virtual series from the Southern California News Groups, here to give you tips, tricks, and insights that you probably won't get anywhere else for getting the most joy and productivity out of your gardening experience, and also to help you find a community of like-minded green thumbs, or in my case, a wannabe green thumb. I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the Senior Editor for Premium Content here at the Southern California News Group, and I want to say thank you to all of our Reader Reward subscribers, and really to all of you for supporting our virtual programs. And by the way, if you are a Reader Reward subscriber attending today, you're automatically automatically entered to win a $100 gift card to Home Depot, which should come in handy. And if you're not a subscriber, well, why aren't you a subscriber? Go to scng.com forward slash subscribe to find your local paper and join us uh, for all the fun. Uh, let me remind you of a few things before we get started. Because you're attending today, you're going to be muted. Um, there are just too many people to have on, on screen all at once, but if you have questions, and we hope you do, please use the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar, and certainly if you want to make comments, use that chat feature found there as well. Um, we'll respond as much as possible. Keep in mind, this is a freewheeling conversation, but you're going to have slides to refer to as, as, as we go, and the information is also going to be emailed to you after the show. The session will be videotaped as well, and a link is going to be sent to you so you can share or revisit some of your favorite moments. You're not going to lose anything. Uh, it's also posted at scng.com forward slash virtual events, and that's where you can find all of our past virtual shows and see what's coming up next. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our resident expert and gardening rock star, I might say, Joshua Siskin. He's the gardening columnist at the LA Daily News since 1993. Joshua holds a master's degree in horticulture from UC Davis, and he's also a landscaping and gardening practices, or he's, I should say he's been a, a gardening and, and landscaping practices instructor for the Los Angeles School District and UCLA Extension. He's also owned his own management company, uh, landscape management company, and get this, he's a licensed psychotherapist. So the joke I always make is that's why he's good at getting to the root of our gardening issues. Anyway, hello, Joshua, how are you? Uh, how are you? Great. Well, listen, many of us might not have yards, but love gardening nevertheless with outdoor containers on our patios and our balconies. And even if we have yards like me, um, we've got containers too. But these containers pose some interesting challenges. So today, I guess you're going to be going over the fundamentals of, of container gardening. And then next month, we're going to drill down on vegetables and herbs and fruits, the edibles, as it were. Anyway, so let's get started. Where do we begin? All right. So the best place to begin is at the beginning, which is uh, <laughs> in ancient Egypt, uh, 2500 BC. They found uh, on, a, on a tomb, they found some, uh, some containers that look an awfully lot like uh, terracotta. In fact, uh, in ancient Egypt, that was the first place where they used container plants and they made them out of terracotta, which means baked earth, okay? And they use these, uh, these pots in everyday life for a lot of different purposes. And they also used them when they wanted to move a plant from its natural habitat into a royal garden. Uh -huh. And you can see it, it apparently the first uh, container plant was a, was a, uh, a water lily, which has a, a religious significance to the ancient Egyptians. As you can see, what the, 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 there's a parallel between uh, what you see on the tomb and what, you, what the, the blue lily really looks like. I don't know. I think it looks like an aloe vera, but let's. It could be aloe, you know, aloe vera is actually native to Saudi Arabia, so it's not that far away. Okay, so fair enough. Anyways, go ahead. Aloe vera. Yeah. Now, the next historical mention of a, of a container garden is the so called uh, 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 hanging gardens of Babylon, which uh, is actually. They've never found archaeological evidence, but there's a lot of uh, 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 writing historians, Greek and Roman historians who wrote about it. And uh, what it was, they, 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 they built a, uh, there was a, a, a king uh, of ancient Babylon who built a palace with the express purpose of putting a garden on it. His, his wife was, was uh, homesick for native Persia. So we brought in a lot of plants from her uh, country and, um, and it's called hanging because, or overhanging because the trees were overhanging the, 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 the edges of the gardens. But the fascinating thing is that we have a recapitulation of this because on the bottom right, you see a, a picture of a garden in Hamburg, Germany, where they've, uh, it, it, it almost looks the same. They, they've uh, 
they brought greenery to the to the upper stories on the roof of this uh, this building. And in fact, in many cities in Europe now, uh, it's a it's it's a law that, that new buildings have to have a roof garden. So um, people are are bringing plants more and more into their lives through uh, container gardens and roof gardens and whatever. That's fabulous. I've I've seen that too in Milan, Italy. They they have some beautiful buildings like this as well. So you're right. It's 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 everything old is new again. I guess. You're right. And so here are the first pots that that that, that we know for certain were um, used for plants were found in the uh, in the ashes of the of the Vesuvius volcano. That, that erupted in 69 AD. They found these pots, they called oli perforati because they had perforations in them. And here the, the, the containers are turned upside down. What the Romans would do is they would take a branch from a tree and it was probably a citron or a lemon tree and they would root that branch in the, the container. If you take a branch and bend it and have soil in it, right. then you can root that, that branch. And then once the branch was rooted, they would break the container Right, it already had roots in it. They would detach it from the mother plant, and then they would be able to plant it into their garden. So that was the first application of a of a container plant for for a practical purpose beyond just showing uh, the plant, but actually using it for propagation. That that circular fountain is beautiful too. Well, the circular fountain was also found underneath the uh, the ruins of the uh, of the Vesuvius volcano. Yeah, it looks a lot like something that people might have in their garden today. Yeah, it does. Well, speaking of which, let's move on to uh, to today. Okay, so the the uh, we're talking to talk about ter terracotta pots, but there's a big big difference between expensive Italian terracotta and other types of terracotta. Okay. The, 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 the still, if you want the real thing, you want to get the Italian clay pot, the Italian ter terracotta, and the reason for that is that it's fired at 1980 degrees, which a lot of, if you, if you fire uh, terracotta at a lower temperature, it won't last as long. A hundred degrees difference in the temperature can be the difference between a pot that lasts for a hundred years and a pot that lasts for two years. Ah. So you, you want to pay extra for your clay pot. Uh, you can see here, there's another uh, interesting uh, concept with clay pots, and that is to create a, a, a patina or a, a superficial uh, uh, look to the plant, to the container that makes it look older than it is. Right, and to me especially, yeah. So, so for instance, like people want the, the, the outside of the pot to look white, it looks aged. So there are different hacks you can do. You can either paint it, you can use yogurt, you can use lime, you can use salt, all different things to make the pot look older. And then there's also what's called the, uh, there's a green patina, right? You can see on the right, where once again, by applying certain um, uh, substances to the, to the pot or just keeping it in the shade, you will create the, 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 this green. It, it could be real algae, it could be real moss, or it could be something that imitates the, uh, the living patina that we think about. But Love there are a lot that. of people that, that may, it makes a big difference to them. Love that. So and, let's move on to my my uh, demographic, the inexpensive terracotta. Right. Well, the inexpensive. You look at the bottom right, right, with a black paint in it. It's a very interesting point. You see, the reason they put this black sealant in there is to keep the soil moist, because what happens in terracotta is that the moisture goes out through the sides of the pot. Okay. Right. And so they brought in this black paint to make it more um, uh, waterproof. So right. the water is not, not going to be able to escape. But those pots, I don't recommend. You're going to see those. I highly recommend that you get the real terracotta and not the, uh, not the, uh, the image. Well, I, I shouldn't say real, but the more, the more expensive, the more durable uh, terracotta than the one with the black paint. But and you then have, on the right, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you have a good hack here about lining the inside of, of a terracotta. Yeah, so here again, and this is very interesting. If you put a, take a, a plastic bag and put a hole in it and put it in a clay pot, so then you put your soil in, the soil moisture is going to be retained because you have the plastic, right? It's kind of like a snobbery. People want to show they have a clay pot, but then really they have the soil inside of a plastic uh, uh, bag. Or there's another thing people do is they'll take their, uh, they'll take their five gallon plastic pot with a plant in it and they'll put it inside a clay pot. And then in between the plastic and the clay, 
you give it an, another layer of insulation, they'll put peat moss and they'll keep that peat moss really moist, okay? So you have a, a plastic pot, let's say, with an eight inch diameter, and then you have a clay pot with a 12 inch diameter. Now by putting peat moss in there and keeping the peat moss wet, you're gonna be able to extend the period that that plant is, can go without water. Especially if you're leaving for a weekend, let's say, and you're afraid the plants aren't gonna get watered. If you do that, you're gonna give them an extra measure of security so that they won't dry up. Well, I think we're going to get to peat moss and, and all the attendant uh, options for that in just a minute, but let's let's continue on talking about containers for just a bit. Yeah, right. So here's here's the, the, the you know, the modern answer to uh, uh, container plants, which is plastic. Right. Um, plastic is, is uh, as you can see, you know, you got all the colors. The one thing I would draw your attention to is the bottom and the middle, it's something called a flower bridge. Planner. So if you're living in an apartment or a, pet or a uh, uh, condominium and you and you have a railing, right? You put this uh, you put this container over the railing and it's adjustable, so it fits any side railing, and it's it's just a very easy way of bringing container plants in, over to your balcony and uh, and not having to you don't have to put them on the ground, you don't have to worry about uh, um, uh, you know the issues of the water ending up on the ground or whatever. So I, I highly recommend those. Well, they're beautiful too. They come in a lot of options. Right. So moving on from plastic. Yeah, so here we talk about the differences, right? The advantage of terracotta, as we said, it allows the roots to breathe due to porosity. And that's very good where cacti and succulents are concerned. There's a certain elegant look to the, to the terracotta. Um, and it also, as we said, it, as it ages, it becomes uh, more more appealing in the sense that it has this, this patina of white or, or green on the outside. And the other advantage, well, is that it's more durable. It doesn't crack like plastic will. Plastic will crack over a period of, of, of a few years. Sure. And now the disadvantage of terracotta is because it loses water through the pores, you're gonna have to water more often. It's also heavier. If you want to move a, 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 a large terracotta pot, it's going to be a lot heavier than moving a plastic pot. And last but not least, it's a lot more brittle. So, you know, if you, if you, if you drop a terracotta pot, it's going to break. So you have to be a lot more careful in that. I've definitely had that experience, but they're so beautiful. Yeah. So, so yeah. but there, there are other options. I love the ceramic. Can you talk a, a little bit more about this? Yeah, so, so the ceramic really, it, I mean, of course, it's beautiful in its own right, but it also is more water retentive, right? Uh -huh. Because you, you, the, the glaze is going to is going to uh, uh, eliminate the porosity that you have otherwise. So you're really kind of making it into a plastic pot in the sense that it's going to have that quality of holding the moisture in for a much longer period of time. So yeah, you can see, you know, there's a Chinese style. Some people would say it's more like a maybe a Mexican style, and then uh, you have a porcelain, and you and uh, you can even have a hanging uh, 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 ceramic ceramic uh, uh, container. They're beautiful. Um, Melody Taylor Spark, uh, Spark, I think. Stark, I'm sorry, I, I, Melody, I messed up your last name, um, mentions that terracotta and ceramic are a lot more earth friendly than plastic, which I think is a good point. Ah, well, that's true. I mean, you know, if, uh, if they break up eventually, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can recycle them, you can repurpose them. Right, exactly. Oh, this is an interesting. Uh, oh, resin, resin is kind of to plastic what, what ceramic is or glaze is to terracotta because you see, resin is, is more like a, a natural polymer as opposed to plastic, which is, uh, which is a, a more manufactured polymer. But resin is a lot more durable than plastic. And the truth is you have all different de degrees of resin in a pot. There are some plants, there's some pots with more resin, some with resin. Less, but just by looking at these, you can see that they have a durability that that, that plastic is lacking. At the same time, they're more lightweight than uh, than terracotta would be. So it's uh, it's another option. I think you see them frequently, don't you? In various. I, yeah, I think especially in, you know in uh, in commercial application, but right. uh, commercial. Yeah. That was my yeah. Oh. Now we have wood, and I have to bring in. Uh, <laughs> Sort of a last minute, but it's very important. On the bottom left, you have the Versailles citrus planter. These planters were invented in 1670 for the Versailles Palace that was being built outside Paris. 
Okay. Wow. And, and they put orange trees in them. And the, 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 the reason for the, uh, it's a very interesting container because it has door or gates on each side, very easy to open them and to see the condition of the roots. And, huh. and, and also being able to, uh, they, were able, they would lift the whole container into what's called an orangerie during the winter time. Um, but this is like the classic container for uh, citrus trees. Yes. Uh, the ones in Versailles live for over 200 years in these pots, okay? It tells yeah. you that, that, that you can keep a plant in a pot for, for many, many, many years. As long yeah. as you prune the roots, you can put it back into the same size container. Uh, and, that, and that's something worth keeping in mind. Um, so and when, then, of course, you have, yeah, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. But say, there are window boxes here and they're hanging baskets. The, the wood is either, it either has some sort of a liner or plastic. Well, obviously, you don't want the, the, the soil in contact with the wood. That so was my next question. Obviously, right rotting is a huge issue, right? Yeah, so it's either you have something there like a plastic or it's pressure treated. If you pressure treat wood, you increase its longevity. Yeah. Um, before we get off, I just want to, to mention a few comments here. Joan Wood uh, observes, as you said, plastic breaks down when it's in the sun, so it's it's not a durable option. And then Helen Harris has the question, is so many plastic and resin containers she bought don't have bo uh, bottom holes for draining. What to do? Do you, what do you recommend? Yeah. Yeah. You got to put holes in. <laughs> yeah. You really do. Here's, oh. here's the thing though. Anywhere you buy a pot without holes, they are going to have a drill. Almost always. All you have to do is ask. Good and point. they'll drill a hole. And, it, and it's actually very, it's a little bit touchy with ceramic because you got to be careful, even with, uh, with terracotta, if you don't do it just right, you can crack the pot. So you better to have the pot cracked on their watch with their drill than, than you doing it on your own. And, and speak, and we might be jumping a little bit, uh, a bit ahead, but uh, Cindy, Cindy wants to know, do plants bust out of resin? Because plastic containers, I guess, can, can bust out, you know, can, can break easily. Is that an issue with resin? I don't think so. From what I've seen, they they're, they're, they seem to, to last uh, for quite a long time. I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them for. And and Ellen Smiley uh, observes well has the question: If you want to keep a tree growing well in a pot, and again this might be skipping ahead a little bit, do you need to remove it periodically and cut the roots, as you mentioned about Absolutely. the root? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you can't, okay. It depends on the size. A tree okay. below six feet. You should uh -huh. probably change the soil every couple of years. Once it gets above six feet and it's going to be in a bigger container, probably maybe every three or four years. Okay. But you have to do that. You definitely have. There's no way you can't keep a citrus tree in a in a in a Versailles container for 200 years without right. doing that root pruning. It's, right. It's essential. Yeah. And you and, can cut up the one tree in the roots at one time. Yeah. Or any other tree. I had ficus trees that eventually died. Was it because I didn't trim those roots? Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. You have to do it. Yeah. Okay. So here's another application of the wood. These are the whiskey barrels or the wine barrels. Um, you know, some people like this look. You can even turn a whiskey barrel into a water garden. They don't last that long, whiskey barrels. They'll last you know, two or three years. But again, if the wood is pressure treated, you can, you can uh, and, and, and waterproof, you can, you can use it as a water pump, a mini wow. water pump. Yeah. I think they look so beautiful. I think we, you and I have discussed this. Right. It's yeah, it adds a nice, uh, you know, it's a, uh, what do we call it? A bucolic touch, you know, yes. you're on the country. Indeed it does. And here's, it's kind of a surprise, but you wouldn't think that concrete would be a, a material that you could make planters of. Obviously it's going to have a lot of durability. And if there are many planters you can find, see there's a three inch on the upper left and then the four inch yeah. uh, with a little uh, pentagonal uh, containers. And then along the bottom, you have these uh, very colorful uh, uh, concrete containers. And uh, right, they probably last uh, forever. forever. Yeah. Hey, uh, I want to just to call this out. Sandy uh, Starkey mentions that that uh, they put a piece of duct tape on the bottom of the planter before drilling a drainage hole in the pot. Never has had a pot break because of it. Beautiful. Yeah. Nice hack. Great. Thank you. Great to know. Great to know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, go. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, metal. So, so metal containers are very expensive. 
But I, I think that, I mean, the look is amazing. It's, it's, a, it's a very elegant look, you know, if you can afford yeah. it. Um, and uh, draw your attention to the copper patina in the uh, uh, third from the left on the top row. If you, if you have a copper container and you just expose it to the elements, it eventually turns blue, 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 green on the outside. And again, that's something that people, something that people like, uh, gives it an aged look, it gives it a you know, different kind of a look. So that's something you want to keep in mind. But I think it's, uh, you know, if you, <laughs> if you really want to go all out, then, then uh, you, you can go into metal or copper as, as it were. Copper, that must cost you an arm and a leg at this point. In yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but, but they're beautiful. Yeah. Oh, this, so, now back to the green question. I love this yeah. part. So yeah, so here we're talking about recycled, or here, these are pots that, that are completely biodegradable. Some uh -huh. are gonna take longer than others, right? The, the coir, which we're talking about later, the coconut coir, which is uh, in the upper left, and then right next to it, the, the, the baskets, and then uh, on the, to, the, to the extreme right on the upper uh, row. Uh, don't, don't, that's going to take a long time to decompose. But the point is, it's not, uh, it, it is biodegradable. One of the, I, I, I draw your attention to the bottom left. There's something called cow pots. They're made out of cow manure and wood fiber, and they actually fertilize the plant as it's, as it's growing. Now, what you could do, of course, is put a plant in one of these and then put it in a nice ceramic container or anything you like, right? So it's it's benefiting from the uh, from the from the cow manure as it grows, but you know you're not having to look at it, right? You you, you can look at uh, something different. Same thing going back, like if you have a plastic pot but it's in a ceramic container, you sort of have the best of uh, or or a, a terracotta container, you have the best of both worlds. Right, built-in so fertilization. I, we have a quick question going back to the metal pots, Joshua. For Kathleen yeah. Hamilton. Uh, just has a question. Plastic liner in metal pots, advisable? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, okay. yeah. For sure. Same thing, same principle, because it would, it would oxidize and you don't want those, those uh, that's going to deteriorate the pot. Right. Great. And, and just for, to everyone in the audience, I'm seeing a lot of questions about vegetables and fruit trees. Please know uh -huh. we're going to drill down into that next yeah year. yeah you next know we're just trying we, to get we, the we, fundamentals we, here but there's more, but i want to say something if you want to if you have a question about edibles email me joshua at perfectplants.com and i'll answer your question within 24 hours okay joshua at perfectplants.com because i don't want people who have questions to have to wait another month to get those questions answered perfect Thank you, Joshua. We, we actually have a comment from Jermaine Romano, who says, I've been using bark for my, for my Metaluca tree to line my baskets. Will I, will I be hurting my tree by stripping some of the loose bark? Ah, wait a minute. She's, she's using bark. She's using bark from, uh, from the Metaluca tree to oh, line her baskets. Know. Will she yeah. be hurting, uh, will, uh, hurting the trees by stripping some of the loose bark? No, yeah. it comes off. It comes off. Yeah, it's go a ahead. Spongy, Dave. Spongy oh. Yeah, no, 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 you want her. Yeah. Oh, and also Karen Fricky, you ask, is redwood suitable for a raised bed? Redwood, wait a minute, raised bed, container, what are we talking yeah, about? It's a container, I think. I, I think yeah, well, well, I mean the bark that's customarily used is either fir bark or pine bark, right? Like if you talk about an orchid mix, you're talking about fir bark or pine bark. Now she's asking, is redwood bark um, suitable for a container? I haven't seen that uh, utilized in that manner. Interesting, so, interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I'll let you go forward, but we've got, we've got a, uh, a, um, a question coming up on how to, trim, uh, tr how to trim the roots of a tree growing in a pot, but we'll, hold, we'll put a pin in that for right now and talk about preparing the soil. Okay. So, so this is good no matter what you're growing. This is, this is good to keep in mind. That when you, take a, when you select a potting soil, you want to, it's, it's a soil that when you, when you just open the bag and you, and you press it, you get a bunch of it in your hand, you don't want it to, to stick together like a ribbon, right? Like a clay ribbon, okay? Right. But you don't want it to fall apart just totally either. You want it to be slightly sticky, but not too sticky. And 
I mean, you're going to say, oh, is the nursery going to allow you to do that? I don't know, but it, it's it's really the test that you want to you want to perform to make sure it's the right kind of soil. So you're looking uh, for Goldilocks soil, is what you're telling me, John. Goldilocks, uh, but the uh, what you also want to do, very important, before you put the soil in a container, you want to moisten it. You want you want to get it really nice and and moist, and so so it's like a wrung out sponge, okay? Because what happens is people put soil into a container. And it looks like it's full to the top or, you know, leaving a, an inch or two for water, to, to water. And then what happens over time is that it's compressed, okay? Uh -huh. and over time, almost immediately, you water it in the container and you see the level drop. But maybe your plants are already in there, right? You have to take out the plants, put more soil. So the whole idea is you want to get good and moist so that when you put it in your container, you get an accurate representation of how full that container is. And the soil level is not going to change. So that's something very important you want to keep in mind. Uh, like we said, leave a space at the top. So when you water, the water doesn't go over the top and take soil with it. And the bigger the container, the more space you're going to leave between the top of the soil and the, and the rim of the, of the container. Um, and the soil, most, most container mixes contain fertilizer, but the fertilizer is only going to last for about six weeks. So you're going to have to, and even from initially, you can put, slow release fertilizer pellets over the top. And you can even start a fertilization program, especially if you're using something very weak, um, like a, especially a foliar fertilizer, like a, a, a liquid seaweed, something along those lines. You have that coming up later at the end. Yeah, we have that coming up. But anyway, um, it's something you want to be aware of. And okay. you want to add it to the mix if it doesn't have fertilizer. And something very important here, the sterile soil mix, see there's a sterile, what is a sterile soil mix? It doesn't have any soil in it. it, excuse me, it doesn't have any topsoil in it, it doesn't have any compost in it, okay? It just has things like perlite, pumice, um, uh, peat moss, or coconut coir, things that don't, uh, don't have a, um, that, they don't have a, a component that, that can rot and, and, and cause disease. Okay, so some people stay away from a potting set where it says, you know, compost in it, they stay away because that can invite uh, disease. Bacteria and right? disease. Yeah. And last but not least, the myth, there's a myth that rocks, gravel, or broken pottery shards at the bottom of a container improve drainage. Forget about it. I've yeah. been doing this my whole life. How many of us okay. have been doing this our whole life? It's yeah. <laughs> so amazing to me. Yeah, because it, look, you just think of it logically. If the soil is in, if the soil is not draining properly, if it's not giving the plant what it needs, what difference does it make what's on the bottom? Right. That's, that's okay. Okay. So Wait, here we have the quick ingredients. Question, quick question. Yeah. Quick question. Ca um, Carol Hansen just wants to make sure that when you say fertilizer, it's the same as plant food. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Although it, it, it is, it, it's interesting though because there's really a distinction, but you know. Plant food, plants make their own food. See, this is an interesting point. Photosynthesis, and but the product is sucrose, which they use as their energy source. That's really plant food. What mm -hmm. we add are minerals, okay? Right. It's just a technical point, but um, you're right. In, in everyday usage, when people say plant food, they mean fertilizer. That's what they mean fertilizer. Good point. Yeah. Um, so, since we're talking about uh, potting soil uh, mixes, etc., Yolanda Lixon wants to know: Is worm castings mixed in potting soil okay for? Yeah, it's very okay. Yes. Very okay. It very helps return. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's it, it helps retain moisture, and it's it's highly recommended. Yeah. Wait. Worm castings, by the way, are fasting a, 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 a euphemism for worm uh, extra. <laughs> It's what passes through their body. Worm okay. dung. Worm dung. Yeah, worm dung or yes. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so yeah, so when we talk about, uh, this is materials that help drainage in the pot. So we're talking about plumus is preferable to perlite, but more expensive. Perlite is a rock that, that, that a lot of, uh, it has to be heated to, at a very high temperature. It's a, it's a volcanic glass, actually. It has to be heated to a very high temperature, and then it uh, uh, it puffs up, and uh, it uh, you create porosity, you create a lot of pores where you know, water and fertilizer can sit. But pumice, you don't—it's not heated up; it's natural. It's mined, 
on the top of the surface, and uh, it has it has more minerals in it than than, than perlite. It's a much better also because perlite rises to the top of the pot, and, uh -huh. and it kind of disintegrates. Hummus, wherever you go, it, wherever it is in the soil mix, it stays there. Okay. Well, but, uh, yeah. Joshua, sorry, since you brought up heat, Bob Simak ha had a question about heat related to, he says, re related to potting soil. He, he says, can I sterilize my possibly infected used potting soil by drying it in the sun? Um, if you're going to solarize it, what you want to do is take a plastic sheet, okay? <laughs> clear plastic. You want to water, water the soil, put clear plastic on it, the sun will then sterilize the soil. Uh -huh. If you just put it in the sun, it's not going to get hot enough to sterilize. By the way, that's another thing. It's called soil solarization. Let's say you have a lot of weeds in a certain area, and you want to get rid of the weeds. Well, yeah. you soak the heck out of the weeds. Then you get a big, clear plastic sheet. You put it over the weed. You take some bricks or something to hold it in place. And the sun beating down on that is going to kill the weeds. Kill it. You know, yeah, like, we'll kill it. Even the worst weeds. So it's, a, it's the same principle. Yeah. OK. We have a couple questions coming up, but I want to let you finish the drainage mix. Yeah, so I, it, it's uh, another one is chicken poultry grit. That's you know something that you feed chickens because it goes into their gizzards and <laughs> grinds up the, the food. Yep. Uh, but yeah, on the upper left, there's something called coarse sand, builder sand, horticultural sand. It's not it's not beach sand, right? It's a certain uh -huh. kind of sand that, that it's going to be a more it's going to be more inexpensive than perlite or pumice. They're basically the same, okay, in terms of what they give to the to the potting soil. You can use either the sand, the perlite, or the pumice. It's the same thing. Um, and then we have the pine or the fir bark on the bottom. That's specifically for orchids and other things too, like bromeliads. You could also use uh, that same uh, fir and uh, pine bark. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next one. And as we do that, I will ask a few, uh, give you a few uh, questions and comments. Em you, we were talking about worm castings. Emily Beerman notes that worm castings are very rich. Be careful of the ratio to the soil to prevent burning the plant's roots, she notes. Oh. Is, would you? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, you know, I'm glad for that, for that input. Uh, I wasn't aware that they're that, you know, that. Uh, they have the kind of minerals that would burn the roots. I thought that was it was more of a um, kind of a benign uh, 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 soil uh, additive from that standpoint, but it's good to know. That that is that is uh, interesting. And and W J Jaffe wants to know what about actually live worms in your in your containers? Is that something? I mean, it, I, it couldn't hurt <laughs> as long as you don't mind seeing the worms. <laughs> I don't know how long they'd sit there. See, that's the problem. Yeah. I think they'd go out. You know, yeah. if you have, you know, because you're not, uh, unless, you know, unless the, the container was just full of uh, 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 horse manure, which is what they love, right? Mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have horse manure and worms, then that's, you know, they're not going to go anywhere. I mean, they're going to stick. And because folks, I have horse manure just in case anyone <laughs> but, um, uh, but speaking of which, we, we do have a question. Should I not be using any compost in potted plants? In container plants. Well, no, it, it, I, I'm just, it's a caveat. It's a caveat. Okay. I'm okay. not going to say no, but I'm just going to say it's a caveat. Some people don't use it because you are inviting the possibility of disease. Okay. Yeah. And okay. so you just want to keep that in mind. I mean, I, there, I'm sure there are people that put compost in all their potting mixes and they don't have problems. So you just want to be careful, especially if you water too much, right? That's going to create an environment for the uh, bacteria, for the microorganisms, the bacteria, and so forth. Great. Good. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll let you get on to to. Um, okay. So, so here we have. There's sphagnum moss and there's sphagnum peat moss. Okay. What's mm -hmm. the difference? The difference is, and by the way, up on the left here we have, it's a it's a wire basket, and they've just packed in sphagnum moss, and it's the perfect substrate for growing uh, ferns. And it's kind of an interesting look, right? You know, it's like when you walk into a building and you see all the pipes exposed. <laughs> so there's a this is kind of an interesting look. But what happens is there are peatlands, okay, which is where sphagnum moss grows. Sphagnum moss is on the top of the surface of the of of, of, of uh, a large area of, of peat, right? Of what becomes peat moss. When it's six or seven years old, it's harvested, right? That's yeah. sphagnum moss. And it's actually used more for lining uh, uh, baskets, lining uh, hanging baskets, or it's also used as a mulch. Uh -huh. over um, indoor plants sometimes. You'll see it's stringy and they put it along the top. 
But a, a few thousand years down the road, sphagnum moss turns into sphagnum peat moss. Okay. Uh, okay. And so people are upset. They think because it's such a, it's, it's kind of a vanishing resource. But even if it's not vanishing, it takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot of heat to 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 um, to bring the peat moss into a condition where it's where it's suitable for use in in uh, in your in your plant mix, right? So as a substitute, they've come up with cocoa coir, cocoa coir, coconut coir, cocoa fiber. Coir. It's all the same thing. I just sometimes I just say it referred to as coir. Okay, all it is it's shredded coconut husk. Okay, everybody knows what a whole coconut is. Yeah, it has the same purpose, and a lot of people prefer it because for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a neutral pH. Peat is a very acidic pH, so that could uh, interfere with the uh, with, with the uh, you know with certain plants that need a more neutral pH. The mm -hmm. other reason is you ever had the experience where you have a, a, a soil in a, in a container and it suddenly shrinks because you haven't watered it enough, right? Right. And the and that's because there's peat moss in it, and the peat moss has shrunk from the size of the container. Coconut coir doesn't tend to do that. It it's more uh, it's more expansive. It's less it's less prone to shrinkage when it dries. It can still do that, but it's not as likely to do that as peat moss. I so, see. And it also lasts longer. Uh, it, it can last for up to five years, whereas peat moss is in a state of advanced decomposition and it, it doesn't hold together as well as the, uh, the coconut coir. So. Great, let's okay. move on to one more slide and then we have a ton of questions. Oh, good. So this is about what holds the water and uh, yeah, we actually don't have peat moss on this slide, but uh, oh well, we just had it on the previous one. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, you see the earthworm castings there, right? And right. he's actually he is holding worms, but I, I don't think you put the worms into the into the container. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, also, leaf mold compost. You see that, and and even kitty litter can be used, especially with plants that need a lot of water. Well, we talked about it's a substitute for academa, which is what it's used to grow for growing. Um, Right. Bonsai plants, it's a lot less expensive. By the way, you have to pick out a, not every kitty litter, but this one, for instance, which is called, um, what does it say there? Fragrance free see. natural clay. Very important. Yeah, because clay, so that's one of them that's totally yeah. suitable. And there are indoor plants like aloe vera, money tree, and ponytail palm that really respond well when this is used in combination with uh, regular potting soil and horticultural sand. So Speaking you can of use it as a substitute for, uh, for um, or peat moss and other other water retentive materials uh, when you when you're looking into your potting mix. Speaking and, um, of, of that, yeah, uh, Carol Appel wants to know what types of plants enjoy coffee grounds in containers. Ah, well, I wouldn't go out of my way to use coffee grounds in containers um, um, because they they do add some acidity. Um, and and the pr the problem with coffee grounds is that if you know if you can distribute them well enough. Then they could be like a, a, a an ass. They could they could add acidity to uh, to the mix, but you want to make sure that, that you don't that it's not clumping, right? Because right. when you get clumping, uh, even when you use it as a mulch, when you get clumping coffee grounds, you get a um, you get a, a undesirable uh, fungi and bacteria in there. Uh -huh. So you could definitely use it, you know. But I would use it uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know judiciously, right? Not to not to heap it on and not to to distribute it quite well and uh, and use it in that way. Yeah, we had a couple questions on that. So good, thank you. Thank you for uh, clarifying. All right, next next one up, ah, here, soil mix. All right, so what I've done here, really this is just to illustrate that there's a soil mix for everything, okay? Uh, if you're growing orchids, there's an orchid mix. You're growing palms, cactus, and citrus, there's a mix. Vegetables and herbs on the right, okay? And but then what I've done is in underneath each type I put what if you want to make it yourself, what are the ingredients, right? Uh -huh. So you don't want to have to spend the money to buy the uh, the mix. You buy the individual ingredients. It's not going to be as expensive, right? Especially if you buy it in bulk. I think one of the interesting points here is that cacti and citrus trees use the same <laughs> soil, right? I mean, Think about that for a minute, because you know, if you put a cactus in a container, you might not have to water it more than once, <laughs> once every blue moon. I mean, I don't know. 
not very often, right? But citrus trees, you're going to have to water them probably once a week at least, okay? So how is it that you have the same mix? Well, it's because they both need very well draining soil. Uh. And that's, that's what it comes down to. Uh, drainage is, is key in any, in any potting mix, and especially when it comes to palm trees and citrus and cacti and succulents. We have an interesting question from Linda, Linda Freeman. She, she wants to know, do banana peels help container plants? That's something I haven't heard. Well, if they're composted, you know, it's a, it's a compost after all. Um, you know, they have, they have potassium in them. But, you know, if, if you chopped up a banana peel very fine and you composted it, it would be fine. You know, you could use it as a, as a form of compost. But you don't want to use anything like that in its raw state. That's the point. You know, okay. you don't want to put a banana peel that, that, that's just a banana peel. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, you would want to compost it first. Susan Reynolds wants to go back to that to that to that point about kitty litter. What ratio should be used when you add kitty litter and other amendments? To I, would, I, I, would, I would use the same percentage that you would use a uh, uh, peat moss or or um, uh, or the cocoa whatever whatever the um, whatever is called for in terms of the uh, water retentiveness. Okay. That, that those ingredients I would use the same. You know, it's usually like one part of this to one part of that and so on and so forth. Nancy Dean also, since we're talking about soil mixes, Nancy Dean wants to know, is organic mix preferable to the non-organic, in your opinion? When you're talking about soil mix? Yes. Okay. First of all, we have to define what we mean by organic, because this is, this is very tricky. Actually, I, I don't know if I said a, a sterile soil mix is something that has organic uh, uh, material. For instance, peat moss is organic. Uh -huh. Cocoa, cocoa flour is organic, but it's sterile. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So it's like, it's when you, strictly organic, strictly inorganic, uh, you'd have to have, you'd have perlite. I don't know if you, maybe if you had, if you had kitty litter and peat moss, excuse me, kitty litter and perlite or pumice, that would be an inorganic mix. And you could do that, right? Uh, yeah, and it would also have some sterility uh, features to it. Okay, um, yeah. The problem with the organic when you talk about organic again, what is organic? Well, if you have compost in there, or sometimes they'll say you know uh, de uh, wood products, right? Decomposed wood products. Um, that's always going to be subject to infection. Okay, interesting. That's going to be subject to infection. That's going to be subject to uh, um, bacteria and, and, uh, and fungi that are going to be detrimental to the growth of the plant and could cause the plant to rot. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, we have even more. Can I ask a few questions here? We've got, oh, this, this uh, slide right here is apropos of, of the questions we have about actually trimming roots growing in a right. pot. So okay. So, yeah. So the first thing you want to do actually you kind of want to shake out the roots and, and you want to you want to see the condition of the roots because anything that's dead or rotting you want to remove that's first of all uh -huh. um, the other thing is you can prune off as much as one third of the root ball okay and what you want to do you don't just want to chop it off the bottom but you want to do it like all the way around equally uh -huh. okay so not just oh i'm going to chop off the bottom third no you're going to take it all the way around right one third of it and then put fresh soil and put it back in. By the way, when, when, how do you know when to repot? Because yeah, it could happen more quickly. If you see a root growing out of the bottom of the pot, it's time to repot. Time to repot. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's a sure way of doing it. Because uh, it might happen. Some plants grow very quickly. You may have to do it more frequently than, than uh, every 12 to 24 months. I'm, I'm, we, we have a question. I'm sorry. We have a question specifically related to trees and trimming the roots of trees growing in pots. Is that this right. holds true no matter what size? Correct. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You have to. If you don't, I mean, it's kind of like the bonsai, right? How do they keep a bonsai plant for hundreds of years in a little trunk? Well, they're continually pruning the roots. Uh -huh. Now, if you want to keep a tree, you know, like in Marseille, where they kept an orange tree for 200 years in a in a in a wooden box. Yeah. Well. How do they do it? They were pruning the roots every year. Uh -huh. Or, you know, when the roots grew, started to grow out through the bottom, they knew it was time to do it again. 
Great. We have we have a few questions related to succulents and native plants. Jean Pimentel wants to know how do you care for native plants in pots versus in the ground? Is there a big consideration difference? Well, I would go with the with the you know with a fast draining soil mix, right? Yeah. The citrus and the and the cactus. Um, not really. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. we could have said this without. You can grow any plant in a container. You know, they have a redwood tree growing in a container in the Brooklyn Botanical Garden inside a greenhouse. Right? But you know what I'm saying? There's no plant under the sun that won't grow in a container. It's just a question of, do you have the time and the energy to keep it that way, right? Especially when you're talking about a tree. Right. Because right? it's going to outgrow it. There's no, there's no question about it. it, it the roots are going to want to, you know, break through at some point. We have a quick question about uh, about potting soil mix again. Diane Hallahan says, if succulent mix is three parts potting soil and three parts perlite, does that mean it's 50-50? I guess so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there you yeah, go. Yeah, three parts, three parts, yeah, for sure. There you go. Oh, and just, just before we get off the, the topic of soil mixes, Linda Freeman notes that the, to be careful with kitty litter, this sounds like the voice of experience, uh, read the labels because it, it if it's clumping, it won't drain. So back to your point, it's got to be all right. There. Right. So it has to be. Yeah, I would. I would go online and make sure that I get the right kind. You know, okay. and uh, and yeah, don't don't uh, don't overdo it. You Great. Know, use it with use it with with, with caution. Um, now, this is a great slide because it's actually a guy who who owns the largest bromine Calanzia. Uh, Growing a nursery in the world, well, North America anyway. Um, but he grows bromeliads, he keeps them in the containers and he puts them in the ground, with, still in the container, right? Now, this is something that's very important, I think, for people to understand. If you buy a, like a really maybe an expensive plant in a container and you're not sure if, if it's going to grow well in your garden or where in your garden, you keep it in the container and you bury it in the ground, or maybe you bury it halfway. Right? Maybe you put, put it in a sunny spot. You think it's gonna grow in the sun. Right. It doesn't grow that well. Now you move it into the shade, right? Or maybe you wanna keep it in the house during the winter time and then bring it out during the summertime, right? Because it's cold sensitive. So that's something, that's an option you, it, it, that it's worth considering, you know? And uh, it looks beautiful as well. Yeah, it doesn't, it's nice. Those are bromeliads, yeah. Oh, wait, we have a specific question on, on trimming roots uh, from Lorena Adeli. Uh, sorry, Lorena, uh, if I'm mispronouncing your name. How do you actually cut the roots with a knife or with it scissors or saw? How do you? Yeah, you can do it with scissors. Absolutely. Scissors. Yeah. Just trim. Any, you know, a, 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 a hand pruners, right? Uh, that, great. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and back to the roots. I'm sorry. One more question. Helen Harris says, "What do I do if plant taproot come through the hole in the bottom into the ground? Can I pull it out without harming it?" <laughs> yeah, well, cut it. You have to cut it. Yeah, cut it. Just cut it, Helen. I wouldn't pull it out. I, I, you know. Okay. But, okay. But actually, actually, let's put it this way: if it's really a significant root, you're probably better off if you can dig it up somehow. Okay. Right. And so it doesn't go into shock. Right. And then maybe, you know, keep it like that for maybe put soil around that root or something. You know what I mean? It should yeah. be okay from my experience. It's probably going to be fine if you cut it. Great. Uh, well, I'll let you get to watering because I know this is a big issue. Oh, yeah. So this probably pertains more to indoor plants, but um, I think in any case, even plants outside benefit when you water the soil and not the foliage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because plants don't like to get their leaves wet. They really don't. I mean, I know it rains, but it rains at the time of the year, and it's okay with them getting the wet. But in the summer, especially Mediterranean climates, plants don't want to get their leaves wet. Uh -huh. And that can lead to a lot of problems, a lot of diseases. So keep keep the water and the soil on them. So the other thing you might want to do is, if, if they're not in really heavy pots, you know, you water a container, the water goes through, maybe put it in the garden, so when the water goes through, it benefits, it, it waters the other plants in your garden, right? Yes. Um, now, when it comes to small plants, you can, especially indoor, but anywhere, if you can put it in a bucket, right, with a couple inches on the bottom, the water can move up into the, through, so you don't have to worry, especially if you, you don't want to get the leaves wet. 
So you put it in a bucket of water, the water moves up, right? You leave it there for 30 minutes, whatever it takes, and then you don't get the lethal. Great. Now, the other thing is to water early in the morning. Very important because, uh, first of all, the water that you put on the container is going to go into the ground. It's not going to evaporate. The other point, though, is photosynthesis, right, is much this is how plants produce their food. We talked before about plant food. Uh -huh. It happens during the day because when the sun is coming out and the water is there, right? Because yeah. photosynthesis is a product of the carbon dioxide in the air and the hydrogen in the water. That's how you get the sucrose. Now, if you water later in the day, the plant's gonna be under stress, okay? And when the plant is under stress, it's not, it, the, 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 the pores on the leaves, okay? that take in the carbon dioxide are going to start to close, okay? Because they don't want to lose water, okay? And then the, the water that's, uh, that's uh, it's not going to come up uh, is easily, you know, the water that comes up is, is, uh, is not going to be as available, therefore. So it's really important that you water early in the morning. That That's, is a great. Uh, we had a question exactly on that from Huma Fazli, uh, whom I hope that helped uh, answer your question. And and speaking of water on leaves, Carrie Campbell wants to know what about misting your plants. Okay, well, indoor, yeah, indoor. That's right. You know, they say misting for uh, to keep the uh, humidity okay. uh, raised. That's, not, that, that, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, you know, that, that that's always a good idea. Yeah. Okay. And um, and one more question about about roots and moving plants. Sorry, Pete no wants to know any tips on how to extract a tightly impacted four foot palm out of the pot. Okay, if it's yeah, so here's a, yeah, that, that's a that's a challenge because sometimes you okay. know how do you do it? First of all, if it's in a plastic container, it's not a big deal. You put yeah. it on its side. You take a shovel. You hit the side of the container, right? Yeah. You roll it over, you hit a little bit more of the side and you just keep rolling it over, keep hitting the side of the container and eventually you can pull it out. Okay. However, if it's in a, if it's in a breakable uh, uh, terracotta pot, that's more of a change. You can't hit it with a shovel, you'll break it, right? Yeah. So under those circumstances, I mean, it depends on how big the pot is. If you can soak that pot in some, some manner, it's going to loosen the soil there. It's going to loosen the, the you know, the roots are going to be able to pull them away from the sides. Great. That would be my best. But the Great. one thing I want to point out at the very last, at the very bottom about watering, how do you water a container? You put the hose in there, right, or your watering uh, can or whatever it is, and you wait until the, wa the water at first is just going to go through. You're not even going to see it. The water is going to keep going down, 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 down. See, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to water my, I'm going to keep my hose in there or my water wand or my, or my uh, watering can. I'm going to let the water soak in for a minute or two and go away. No, 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 no. You water until the water starts rising to the top of the pot. And when it gets to the top of the pot, then you know that all the pores in that soil are full of water. Okay. And then you can water. And then See you what I'm saying? It's yeah. very important. A very good point. We have one more question about watering. Uh, speaking of which, because we're in a drought and we're being, Cindy notes that in the LA area, you're banned from watering for two weeks. Any advice on? Um, oh, in Burbank, yeah. So, yeah. okay. If, if, you're, if you're talking about container plants, um, you know, <laughs> let's put it this way. It's a good argument. When you get into a, sh get a bunch of buckets, and when you go into the shower, I love that. All the water that's coming in the shower is going to go into the buckets. I love okay. that. Yeah. So that's one thing you can do. If you're going to take a bath, same thing. As the water heats up, you yeah. uh, you fill up the bucket. The other thing is, you know, your laundry water. If you can find a way, see where the laundry. I don't know if the laundry water is going. If it's going inside the house. It's going to be hard to do. But right. by the way, there are certain places. I think Burbank is one of them, actually, where they will. They will give you a, they will uh, uh, reroute your laundry water for free. Okay. Oh, wow. In other words, you'll be able to lose, use your laundry water for your garden. You have to double water, right? We sure sure water. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not Burbank, it's Pasadena. Sorry. Pasadena. I'm pretty soon now, I remember. Pasadena will come out at no charge and, and, and reroute your laundry water. 
for okay. your, it's called gray water, correct? And gray water, right, right, right. That's for, for yeah. laundry. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I wish we could do that all the way through Southern California, don't you? I mean, would be certainly- Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, look, there's a guy who I was in touch with. He says he's, he's getting like 200 calls a day right now. Yeah. The best thing that it's, the best use for it is fruit trees. You can water all your fruit trees with, with, with gray water. Well, and, you know, it's, we'll, it's, uh, we'll talk about fruits. Well, problems with other things, but fruit yeah. trees are, are, are the way to go. We'll talk about it. fruits and vegetables and herbs next time for sure, because there are so many questions. I'm so, yeah, so I, don't know. You know, man, I, I think maybe we should, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe we should pass on the, I mean, now there's a lot of good stuff here, but it's like, I don't well, know. Go, I, go, I, go, I would go, say what you said about putting your finger into a certain length or in a certain depth, it's variable. You know, don't don't go by somebody saying, oh, if the soil is dry, everything. Now it might be that if you're growing peppers and the soil is dry at a two inch depth, okay, that's fine. You know, a two inch depth, but how big is the pot? You know, I mean, there's so many different things that go into it that you really, it's from experience that you learn how, when when it, when it you need to walk. Right. It, it's really experience. I, I don't think you can have a quick uh, and easy uh, uh, means of, of, of gauging it. Although there is a moisture gauge, but even a moisture sensor, but even that some people kind of poo poo and they say, you know, it's better that you learn the demands of your plants and know when to water. You know, real quick, because we're almost at the end of the hour, we've had a lot of questions about trimming back plants, trimming back Boston ferns, trimming back native California plants. Is there a, a, a trick of the trade, a rule of thumb to share? Well, trick of the trade, but you never want to prune more than a third off of any plant. Okay. That's the maximum you're going to take off any plant that you're doing. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I have to get to the, uh, <laughs> my friend's, uh, uh, formula for keeping um, moth orchids flowering oh, before we go. Yes. Yeah, let's <laughs> not really I don't want to that one. We'll so, ask our, our, yeah, we'll ask our, yeah, Julie. Yeah, let's go that. to that. Let's go to that. Okay. So this is my friend in Jerusalem, Simon Jacob. It's his formula for growing moth orchids. Now, is there anyone who has not been given a gift of a moth orchid? And after a month or two, or maybe three, it's dead. I have killed more moth orchids than I want to admit. I'm a serial killer. And, and here's the point. What does Jerusalem and Los Angeles have in common? Well, if you take a map, right, in an atlas, and you draw a line from Los Angeles to Jerusalem, it is a straight line. And Los Angeles is on the west end of a continent, Jerusalem, Israel is on the west end of a continent. You really have continuity. So if it works in Jerusalem, it's going to work in LA. And the other point is, as you know, the Jer Jerusalem is called the Holy City, and Los Angeles is called the City of Angels. So obviously, <laughs> what works in Jerusalem is going to work in Los Angeles, right? I love that. <laughs> anyway, so we're talking about moth orchids now. Eastern exposure is ideal. If you don't have east, and, and you Give it three to four hours of, of unobstructed light. This is very important. You know, they say, oh, put it in an east window, south window. If you have a tree near that window, forget it, right? You haven't done anything, okay? So it has to be unobstructed. That's very important. I don't have- I am here, so sorry, Joshua. We are at the end of our hour already. Yeah. Well, you'll have to come back and, 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 and check this out. And- I can't believe we're through. I, I, I mean, know. We didn't do time flew. You, everybody, thank you for your amazing questions. We didn't, we didn't get to so much. Please, uh, please join us again. And remember, this will, this will be recorded. It has been recorded, and it will be sent to you again. Joshua, this is awesome. Remember, Joshua's column runs in Saturday's paper and online and all of our publications. And his and website. Another thing is, you can email me, Joshua at perfectplants.com. Joshua okay. at perfectplants.com and, and his sure. website is the smartergardener.com as well. And meanwhile, you can catch up on all of our past programs you missed by going to scng.com forward slash virtual events. There is so much information there. Again, scng.com 
forward slash virtual events. Um, and remember, next month, we're going to be digging into this even more with fruits, vegetables, and, and um, herbs. And if you'd like to share your thoughts from today, or if you have additional questions, please email us at events at scng.com. And I just have to say one more time. I just want to say one more thing, Samantha. Sure. Um, first of all, we have to thank Julie Corlett, who does the slides. It's the, it's the I wizard was... of ours here. Anyway. Julie... But the other thing is, is there a way that we can go through all these slides so that when they come to look at it, they will see the slides that, that we didn't have time to cover? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, we're already at, at, at noon. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to do that. But please know that you're going to see so much information that's going to be emailed to you if you registered for today's event. And again, Julie Corlett is our program manager. Thank you, as always, for being the, the Oz behind the curtain, Julie. And I just want to get to, and one more time, if you're not a subscriber, but you want to get all this information and, and entertainment we offer, give us a call at 877-469-6133. Again, thank you for the support. And Wow, we have so much to do next time. Thanks so much.